Hey everybody, welcome to End of Life University podcast. This is episode number 193 and I'm your host Dr. Karen Wyatt and once again I'm changing it up here a little bit, leaving out the pre-recorded intro just uh, for those of you who are probably really tired of listening to the same thing over and over again because I'm also tired of that. So I'll let you know today's episode is part seven of the Mortal Wisdom series where I'm sharing with you some of the lessons that I learned about life by coming close to death and sitting at the bedside of those who are dying. And so these are really spiritual lessons that I'm talking about, not religious, not related to religion necessarily, but only related to, I would say, the soul, our inner selves, our inner being, and how we learn and evolve and grow through life. And I felt like these lessons are of great importance to our lives and they have definitely changed how I live my life and that's one reason I've wanted to share this series. Today I'm going to be talking about the thorn and the rose, pain as a portal for grace. And I'll share with you a little bit about why I chose this topic, particularly for this week because this week, just a few days after I'm doing this recording, will be the 30th anniversary of my father's suicide death. And those of you who have been listeners for a long time or who know my story know that my father's death was a pivotal moment in my life when the trajectory of my life changed forever. I was a family doctor at the time, and that is what ultimately led me to become involved in hospice and do end of life work. And so this week, we will be observing the 30th anniversary, which it's really hard to believe that it's been 30 years since my dad died, and that I've been on this journey of grief for that many years. And I really wanted to honor that day by talking a little bit about pain and the pain that comes with simply being alive on planet Earth. And I think it's one of the most important topics we can discuss because really the measure of our lives comes down to how well we navigate the pain and suffering that comes to us during our time here on Earth. I have often said that I view Earth as a planet of suffering because if you look around at all of life on planet earth life exists here because of the death of some other life form and all you have to do is spend a short time in nature to see the truth of that every tree in the forest is growing because of the nutrients in the soil that that are there from the death of other living things in that forest from deaths of other trees trees and flowers and grasses and even animals in the forest that have given up their life energy and nutrients to the soil that then nurtures the growth of other living things in the forest. Also, if you spend much time in nature, you come to understand that in the animal kingdom, animals survive by eating other living things, by eating plants and other animals, and including us, and that's how we survive. We survive from the gift of the life of other beings on this planet. And so in some ways, this suffering of mortality is built into our very existence. It's built into the fabric of this planet, also the universe, if you look, look at it, because even stars die, galaxies die, solar systems die, uh, eventually over time. So we know that mortality, impermanence, change is what makes life possible. And here on this planet, it's evident to us wherever we go. And so it occurs to me that our existence here depends on our ability to live with, cope with, and thrive in spite of the suffering and the pain that exists on the planet. The whole key to our existence is learning how we live with difficulty, challenge, and pain. 
And that's why these lessons from mortality are so important to us. Because if we devote some of our time and energy into looking at these lessons, into facing our mortality, facing the fact that we will die one day, that we will grow old one day, that we will experience illness and loss and grief. When we face those facts of our existence, we're much more likely to be able to build a conscious life that holds the pain in one hand, but also learns how to navigate it and how to create beauty in the midst of that pain. And the title for this episode that I chose, The Thorn and the Rose, came from a verse from the Sufi poet Rumi that I wanted to read for you today, which is, Don't run away from grief, O soul. Look for the remedy inside the pain. Because the rose came from the thorn, and the ruby came from a stone. And so I love this idea of Rumi's, which I see often as a theme throughout his poetry and his writings, that the remedy for our pain and our suffering lies within the pain and the suffering. So the remedy for grief lies within grief. And in the case of uh, my grief after my father's suicide death, which I've talked about a lot, was devastating for me, grief and guilt and um, which really, really wiped me out for a long, long time. But about three years after his death, when I was still very much floundering and not functioning that well in my personal or work life, uh, it occurred to me that I had been trying all of those years to go back to my life as it was before my dad's death. I had been trying to to live backwards and to undo the pain and suffering I had experienced. All I wanted was to wake up one morning and feel the same way I felt before my dad's death. And suddenly I woke up one day and realized that that was crazy, that that was very strange that I just wanted to try to go back to the past and that that wasn't even possible, that I I was in a new place now and somehow I was going to have to figure out how I could live in this new place. At that point, I got an inspiration one day that I should call hospice and find out if I could volunteer there. And this was at a time in my life and my medical career when I didn't really even know for sure what hospice did. I honestly didn't even know if we had a hospice in our community. So I got the inspiration that I needed to call hospice to see if there was any way I could work with them or if they had a spot for a volunteer. And this is kind of my legendary story. I I looked up in the yellow pages and found out we did indeed have a hospice in my community. And I called them out of the blue, not really even knowing what hospice did, not even knowing if there was any way I could work with them or what that might involve. And uh, I asked if they if they ever used volunteers and then said, I'm a doctor. And the director of the hospice that I spoke with, a nurse, Suzanne, was completely shocked and said, what made you call us right now? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I just got the just the idea just came to me. And she said, because our medical director just resigned 30 minutes ago. And we've been in a panic wondering how we could keep our hospice open if we don't have a medical director. And now here you are, you show up at exactly the perfect time to help us out. So just like that, in that moment, I became a volunteer hospice medical director with no training or experience, no knowledge whatsoever about death and dying or about hospice and, and the care of the dying. But it was actually the perfect place for me to be at that point in my journey, because the moment I started working for hospice was the moment I turned toward my grief instead of trying to run away from it. And just like Rumi said, I began to seek the remedy for my pain inside the pain instead of avoiding and running away from my own grief and pain. I turned toward it. I turned toward the pain of others who were going through their own dying process, of families who were experiencing 
grief and bereavement after the death of their loved ones and anticipatory grief before their loved ones died. I spent hours sitting with them and learning from them and sharing with them, sharing in their pain as a way of going even deeper into my own pain. So that work with hospice became for me a lifeline in a way through my grief pain that over time helped me gradually heal and recover from this deep, deep guilt and grief that I was still carrying with me after my dad's death. It was not an easy process. So by no means am I trying to sum it up here as, oh gosh, I just showed up one day, volunteered for hospice, and suddenly everything was better. Because I remember it was on the 11th anniversary of my father's death. I went away for a retreat for a weekend by myself. I stayed at a little hotel near a hot springs and I brought all my notebooks and my laptop and I I wrote for about 11 hours a day. It was incredible how much was flowing through me. But I had some really powerful experiences on that little retreat that opened me up. That was a huge milestone in my grief process and working through my grief. And so this was 11 years after my dad died. I'd been on a, a journey of grief all of those years and At 11 years, I still had significant issues to work through. And now it's been 30 years and I'm still working on it. I'm still carrying it. I'm still carrying the pain of grief. So by no means do I want to imply at all when I share these verses and these inspirations that, oh, grief is something if you just look at it and you're willing to face up to it, you'll get through it and it will go away because it doesn't go away. Grief is something that we carry within us always. I feel the the day my dad died, my heart broke open in a specific way. And that wound of grief and pain, it's never going to seal back up again. My heart's never going to become whole in that way again. But the hole that was left behind now has become a source of beauty in my life that I've been able to use over time. Again, not quickly, not immediately. And this is all a reflection that comes from the long view of 30 years of time and looking back at how things changed and how things progressed over time. But I want to share these thoughts with you, uh, I guess on the one hand, to provide a sense of hope, because I do remember when I was in the midst of, of my grief and this deep confusion and questioning, will I ever smile again? Will I ever feel joy again? I remember that there were times when I found some hope in hearing that someone else had survived something traumatic for them. And had come out on the other side of it. I guess we say that, we use that metaphor of coming out on the other side as if we've been in a deep tunnel. And I'm not sure that that's really accurate because I I feel like I'm still in a tunnel, but the tunnel has much more light in it now. And so I'm not sure that there is an other side and that somehow you suddenly come out of the tunnel and now you're in the light and everything has changed. I feel as though it's all a tunnel and we stay in the tunnel, but there's much more light inside the tunnel and I can see so much more clearly where I've been and I can see a little further down the road where I'm headed now and for many, many, many years I couldn't see. I didn't have vision inside that tunnel. Now, there's definitely light shining behind me, and I can look back in retrospect and see all kinds of changes and good and positive things that came from my pain. And again, it has taken a long time to have that perspective and that vision. When I was in the midst of the deepest pain, I couldn't see anything, and I didn't know where I was headed. I didn't know why I was where I was. I didn't know how or if that would ever change. And I had no idea what it would take for that to change or how to cause it to change, what to do for myself at the time. But as I said, I did from time to time receive hope when I heard other people tell their stories and talk about what they experienced. And I viewed those 
as threads from which I was weaving kind of a lifeline for myself. I was braiding together all these little threads of hope as something that I could just hold on to that would keep me from drowning on any one particular day. So my hope is as I share these thoughts and my my own story that for anyone out there listening who's experiencing grief right now or in the midst of some sort of trauma that that you're carrying and feeling the pain from and and suffering with that perhaps my story or my words will be just another thread for you a thread that maybe will help you today to get through today and maybe for another day also in no way am I implying that this is all you need and you'll be fine Also, the truth is, as I said, the grief journey, and I do consider it a journey now, I wasn't sure it was a journey before I thought it was a deep, dark hole. And I thought it's I'm not going anywhere. I'm stuck in one hole, and I will always be stuck here. That's how it looked to me for a long, long time. I couldn't recognize the journey that I was making and the process I was taking until many years down the road. So I know that some people who are feeling like they're in the bottom of the deep, dark hole might feel offended when other people say, it's a process, you're on a journey, because it doesn't look like it at that time. And it's probably not helpful to use those terms for you if that's where you are. It's not helpful for me to say to you, oh, just wait, someday you'll see that this was a journey and a process. And so... I have great empathy for being in that place. I understand how that feels. So please in no way feel judged if you see yourself in the hole and you can't imagine that you could leave the hole and all you're doing is trying to figure out how do I survive in this deep dark hole where I am? How do I survive or not survive being here where I am? That's all okay. No matter where you are, I'm just sending you my love and my compassion because I have felt like that myself in the past. I have been in a deep, dark hole. And if that's where you are, I'm sending you all of my compassion and love for wherever you are in this moment. And I don't presume in any way to be handing you answers or solutions, and particularly, especially not to be handing you judgments for the place where you find yourself right now. There's no right or wrong way to grieve, and there's nothing that you have to do or need to do in order to change. And that's part of what what we're going to be talking about today. Why I said in my subtitle, pain as a portal for grace. And so anyone listening out there who is in the deep, dark hole of grief, please just know that I'm sending you huge love and compassion for you where you are right now. And there's nothing that you have to do. There are no expectations on you. Please know that you are supported for being in the place wherever you are. And take anything that serves you from what I have to say. Please toss away anything that doesn't serve you right now. That isn't the right thing for you to hear right now. Please let it go lightly and don't take it in upon yourself. But if someday down the road you have a different view of things, maybe this is something you'll return to at that time that uh, some of my words might feel like they fit better or feel more appropriate for you down the road. Who knows? That's possible. So as I mentioned, coming up upon the 30th anniversary of my dad's suicide, uh, if you're a longtime listener, you might know that a couple of years ago, I did a series called Suicide Surviving the Aftermath, which detailed my search over the past 30 years for understanding of my dad and his suicide and to find answers to some of my questions about what was happening in my dad's life? What was going on inside of him that could have contributed to his suicide? Now, in some ways, that kind of search is a futile search, because of course, I can never know, I can never really know what my dad was feeling or thinking at that time. He didn't leave us a note. We don't have a lot of indications of what was really happening for him. So all of this search for me was just a way of gathering more information about my dad and hearing stories about him and reviewing parts of his life that I had never really thought much about before. 
in order to add a few pieces to the puzzle, to put to put a few of those pieces in place so that I could get a better picture of who my dad was on the day that he died and some of the factors that might have contributed to his suicide. So that series you can find in the previous episodes and I will link to those in the show notes at EOLU podcast so that you can check those out if you're interested in listening to them. So it's it was a fascinating experience for me, just learning a lot about my dad's past and history, and then also studying how some of those factors, what we know from research, like how some of those factors might have contributed to his suicide. So I won't go into details here about that, about my dad or about his death. I'm more talking about my own process and the impact dad's death had on me. And as I mentioned, I was a young doctor in medical practice and family practice at the time of my dad's death. I'd been out of residency and practicing medicine in my own clinic for three years. When dad died, I was very successful, very popular as a doctor. I had a six month waiting list of patients trying to get in to see me, new patients who wanted to come to see me. And things were going really well. I was married and had two little babies, a two year old and a four month old when my dad died. But my life was just upended by his death. And partly, of course, because I was a daughter, and that was a terrible way to lose my father to depression and suicide. But also because as a family doctor, I had trained quite a bit in behavioral health and psychiatry. I I had even done a full year fellowship after residency in psychiatry. And so I often treated patients who were depressed. I had worked with patients who were suicidal before. So to have my father die from suicide and to know that I was not able to help him, I could not save his life. I could not make a difference for my dad that would keep him alive. That absolutely floored me as a doctor. It caused me to lose all my confidence in myself as a doctor. I felt like a total failure. Here was one of the people I loved the most in the world, and I didn't have an answer for him. I didn't have a way to help him. So I totally questioned myself. I lost all of my confidence as a doctor, and I wondered if I should even be in practice Uh, And that was very destructive and devastating to me, the guilt that I carried with me over those years. And when I found my way to hospice three years later, I found an area of medicine that I'd never known anything about before. I had no idea, but I found a place where I could be broken open and still function perfectly well. In fact, function better than I ever had before as a doctor. I found a place where with my grief and with my self-doubt and my lack of confidence and my confusion, I actually fit really well because I didn't come into hospice with any preconceived notions about what dying is or what death should be like or how people should accept grief or or be there for their loved ones. I, I came in in some ways as a blank slate where death and dying is concerned. And so I was able to be very open hearted and very open minded in my work with the dying. And I quickly learned what I needed to know medically. That was fairly easy for me to grasp to learn about pain management and symptom management for the dying. Um, But it was more the spiritual and the emotional aspect of dying that I was wide open to. And so I came in as a student. I learned from the nurses I worked with a huge amount of information from them, from following them around as I saw patients. And I learned from the patients and their families as well as I spent hours and hours with people who were going through the most difficult experience of their lives and sitting with them, asking them questions, hearing their stories was such a powerful experience for me. And gradually I saw myself learning this expanded view of what life really is and what death is really about. And so all of this wisdom that I've been trying to share with you in the, in this mortal wisdom series came from those bedside conversations with the dying. 
that plus my own spiritual journey of some of the reading that I have done, had done and some of the spiritual teachers from wisdom traditions that I had been reading, combining all of that together gave me a really big picture of what's important in life and what's important in our death. So from that work and from that knowledge that I was gathering, eventually came the book that I wrote titled What Really Matters, Seven Lessons for Living from the Stories of the Dying. And these mortal wisdom talks that I've been giving have been based in large part upon the wisdom that I wrote about in that book. And many of the stories I've told are part of that book. Uh, some of you might may have read it and may know that already. But in essence, what I was sharing is how my life trajectory changed because of the death of my father. I found my way to hospice gradually over time. I found my way to this expanded spiritual vision of both life and death gradually over many years of time. But all of that came about as a result of my dad's death. I got shifted into a completely different course, a different path on my life journey that I can look back now, 30 years later, and feel gratitude for. I can feel so grateful that this this change happened for me. And in this regard, I can see what Rumi meant in his poem when he said, look for the remedy inside the pain because the rose came from the thorn. I understand what Rumi meant now because all of the work I'm doing in my life now, this podcast, the books I've written, the speaking that I do, all came about as a result of my dad's death and as part of my journey through his death. Everything I'm doing now is a result of that trauma and that tragedy of my dad's dying. And I can say this was not a change that I wanted and not a change that I welcomed in the beginning, but it was a change that came to me in my life. It was tragedy and trauma and pain that came in my life that I had to find a way to live with. I had to find a way to carry it in my life. And another quote that I love, this is from Kenji Miyazawa, who is a Japanese poet who lived about a hundred years ago. And he wrote, we must embrace pain and burn it as fuel for our journey. And I love this. I love this idea that the pain is something that we can utilize to help us along the way. And ultimately now I look back and realize my pain over my dad's death, my own grief was my fuel as a hospice doctor. It was the fuel that compelled me to get better and better at sitting with my patients and being present for them. And it was the fuel that motivated me to be there and to be present as the best possible doctor I could be for for them. And that also motivated me to learn the spiritual lessons that I ended up learning and still motivates me right now to record this podcast, to be putting information out to the world wherever I can, that can help other people who are looking at death and dying, looking at mortality, and trying to understand and make sense of all of it in this world. So that pain has been an important fuel for my journey through life. And I think that's a beautiful way of looking at it. Turn the pain into fuel. And I do want to say again, as I mentioned, that sometimes when we're in the middle of the deep, dark hole of grief, the idea of how do I turn this into fuel? I don't get it. How can that happen? And I want to say that for me, in no way was that a conscious choice. Like, oh, I have all this grief pain, I'm going to use it as fuel and make change in my life. No, no, I didn't consciously even know that was happening at the time. And so I believe that what happens for us in this process, while we're simply figuring out how we're going to survive from one day to the next, is that we experience grace in our lives, which is what allows us to embrace the changes that that happen for us. 
And I have a quote from Anne Lamott, the American novelist and now nonfiction writer as well, who said, I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. And I think that describes it perfectly. Grace can enter into our lives wherever we are and we don't understand it. We don't know why or how grace comes to us, only that grace carries us from one point to the next. In its own gentle way, grace carries us through terrible turmoil and trauma and brings us to a new place where we can see something differently, where where we might have a new inspiration or find a new way for one more day to get through the difficulties that we're facing. And so I subtitled this episode pain as a portal for grace, because I believe pain in some way breaks us open and makes us receptive to being carried by grace, to being carried gently from where we are right now to a new place, however it is that grace works. And so this ability to burn our pain as fuel, I think comes to us from grace. I think it's grace that gives us the inspiration or allows us or assists us to use our pain as fuel to make change, to move in a slightly different direction, to see things differently, to look back on the past and and see with greater clarity and more illumination where we've been and to have a better understanding of what is happening for us. And in my case, it helped me see my dad more clearly and understand him and his life and his pain and the trauma that he had experienced and to see that more clearly so that I felt less confusion about why my dad might make a choice like ending his own life. And I view that all as grace, as grace, this beneficent force that carries us through our difficulties. It comes to us unbidden. We don't, we don't, we haven't called upon grace necessarily. It comes to us unbidden, unexpected, and even unrequited because grace doesn't ask us to pay a fee for experiencing it. Grace is given to us for free. It shows up when we need it. Who knows why? And There are no expectations attached to grace. It's just a gift that shows up that helps us move a little bit from one place to the next. So when we're in the midst of the deep, dark hole, once again, there's nothing that we need to do because grace comes to us again, unbidden and unexpected. And there are no requirements. Grace will show up whenever it arrives. And you can't rush the process. Just be open and just wait for it to come. Be patient and grace will one day show up and perhaps help you and carry you just a little bit further and bring a little bit more light into the place where you are right now. And so even these messages that I'm sharing with you right now, for some could end up being a tiny vehicle of grace that could help you see a little bit differently and could could help you find a little bit more light wherever you are. But all of this information has to be received a little bit at a time in tiny little bites at a time. It, it, you can't take all of it in at once. And it has to be when you're ready for it and when the timing is right. And if you receive information like this, when it's not the right time, it might sound insulting. It might sound ludicrous. It might sound like that person has no idea where I am or what I'm feeling right now. And so if you have that response, that's perfectly normal. And that's just you being wherever you are right now in the perfect place where you are. And so again, you don't have to do anything to change where you are. You simply have to allow yourself to be where you are and not judge yourself and not allow anyone else to tell you that you should change or tell you that you should move in one direction or another. You are in the place where you're meant to be 
and you are simply in a waiting place where you're being held and where grace will arrive when, whenever it comes, whenever the timing is right and there's nothing that you need to do for that to happen. And again, grace is a mystery, so we can't explain it and we don't know why or when it comes to us. And again, it's really something we only recognize in retrospect when we look back after a long time and when more light is in our tunnel and we can look back and see it, sometimes we might recognize, ah, that's when grace came to me. That was grace. I see it there. And sometimes hope comes to us from those experiences of looking back in the past. And so that's something I have taken great comfort in is that all of these years of being in this tunnel, this grief tunnel and uh, working through this experience of my dad's death have all of these years have really helped me like when it was time for my mom to die I had so much greater awareness and knowledge and wisdom and depth about death and dying and my own grief process and the ability to sit with my mom to find healing and forgiveness with her and to express the deepest possible love it was phenomenal for me and I could look back on my grief journey over all of the previous years, like 24 years of grief that I'd already been through after my dad and see how much that pain had helped me grow and how much I had been able to burn the pain on my grief journey and learn from it so that when it was time to be there for my mom, I was able to be there in a much more powerful way than I ever would have before in my life. So I could look back and feel gratitude for the pain itself, gratitude for the journey I had been on, gratitude for the grace I have received over time. So once again, the gratitude and the grace are things that we experience in retrospect, when we look back upon the past. And again, this is a long term strategy. Grief is a lifelong process. So it's something that after we've gone through years of it, that we may be able to recognize. And one final message I want to leave about grief and about our pain that I have experienced is that in my case, I really believe, you know, I, I mentioned there was a time in the deep, dark hole of my grief when I really wondered if I would ever smile again, if I would ever spontaneously laugh or feel joy in my life. And I really didn't think it was possible. I didn't think I would ever experience that again. But eventually what I found is that because of the depth of my grief, when joy did begin to return to my life, I had so much more capacity for joy than I had ever had before. My joy was as deep as my grief had been. And that was a, a tremendous gift for me and a complete surprise. And I didn't realize when I began to smile and I began to laugh and I began to enjoy just being alive, enjoy being here, how vast that experience was for me, something much greater than it had ever been before my father died and before my journey of grief. So I came to see pain and suffering as in some ways a process of breaking us open, as I have said, but also hollowing us out inside to increase the capacity for love and joy and light, increase the amount of, of joy that we could hold and carry and experience in our lives. And that's how it felt to me. Like I became so much emptier inside so that I could contain and carry so much more beauty and joy and love for life itself. It took a long time to get to this place, many, many years before I could get here and say that. But I have come to, in, in this way, honor my experiences of pain and suffering for the emptying that they provide me and for the deepening that they have provided me. And so that's how I, I look forward 
ahead, knowing that life is not done with me yet, and that there will be more suffering, and there will be more pain in this life, and there will be many more changes that I will experience as I as I grow older and continue to walk on this journey. But I hold that knowledge and I look ahead to that knowledge without fear. I look ahead knowing that I have experienced grace in my life. I have experienced the depth of pain and I have received the depth of joy that has followed the pain and that accompanies the pain. And because of that past experience, I have confidence now that I am in a much better place for whatever the future holds for me, whatever I might experience in the future. And so I have another quote from Rumi that I want to share, which I find as a really beautiful reminder. So this quote says, sorrow prepares you for joy. It violently sweeps everything out of your house so that new joy can find space to enter. It shakes the yellow leaves from the bow of your heart so that fresh green leaves can grow in their place. It pulls up the rotten roots so that new roots hidden beneath have room to grow. Whatever sorrow shakes from your heart, far better things will take their place. And so again, as I was as I was saying, I think that poem is, uh, Rumi has such a beautiful way of expressing it, this idea of sorrow sweeping everything out of your house so that there's space now for new joy to enter. And this sweeping out is hard and it's painful as grief and suffering and illness and loss come to us and really test us to our very limits and and sweep us clean inside but over time in the long run we're being opened up so that the joy can enter us and that's the hopefulness that I have discovered through the suffering that I've experienced that's why I'm here that's why I'm doing this and sharing these messages in my podcast because I really believe that if we face the difficulties that we have experienced in the past and that lie ahead for us, certainly on this journey, then we're not, we're not being overwhelmed by them. We're not being intimidated and shut down and paralyzed by the pain we have experienced or by the pain that is going to come to us later in life. We're taking it in hand. We're carrying it. We're allowing it to sweep us out and we're open to receiving the joy and the love and the light that can come to us. We're ready for it to fill us and we're being made stronger and more resilient each step along the way for whatever else life has in store for us down the road. And we don't know what it will be. It's a mystery. We don't know what pain is there waiting for us on this journey, but we can be assured most likely there will be pain. There will be suffering. This is the planet of suffering. As I said, uh, suffering is built into the fabric of existence, not only on this planet, but in the universe. So we can know for sure we will be asked to carry more pain in the coming days and months and years of our lives. And the more we can utilize the pain that we've experienced in the past, the pain we're experiencing right now, burn it as our fuel, let it make us stronger, let it open us and sweep us out and prepare us to receive even more joy. The more we can be in that space, the more we allow grace to gently move us from one place to another, the more we will be ready for whatever comes our way. And the more skillfully we will navigate those coming difficult times and the more we will actually be able to help those around us who are in pain at the same time the more we'll be able to reach out and we'll be able to send out our lifelines to others and help others along the journey who who might be floundering who might be a little bit lost in the darkness so my wish for you as you receive this message and 
all the other messages that I've brought to you through the Mortal Wisdom series is that you can take a look backwards and see your own pain and how you have carried it through your life and see also all the moments when grace gently helped you move from one space to another. Grace gently left you in a new place where you might find a little bit more room and a little bit more opening for more joy and love and light to enter into your life. So I hope that you've enjoyed these seven parts of the Mortal Wisdom series. I'm planning in two weeks to come back and do kind of a summary of what I've talked about so far. And perhaps I'll have other episodes in this series as well on Mortal Wisdom. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes in the future. Meanwhile, remember there's a new episode every Monday. And next week I'll be bringing you an interview once again. Um, So stay tuned next Monday for that interview. For today, these are the announcements, which I'm now saving till the end of the episode for you. Um, So those of you who don't want to listen to them can just tune out if you'd like to. I want to thank my new supporters on Patreon, Robin Mott and Amy Wallace. Thanks so much for joining the team and offering me your support each month at patreon.com forward slash E-O-L-U. And also thank you to Christina Ensminger for uh, increasing your pledge each month. Greatly appreciate all of you. Thanks once again for being my patrons on Patreon. Also, just one more announcement. Again, I've been talking about this every week. The fact that the beautiful Dying Expo is coming up November 2nd and 3rd in San Diego. If you're interested in being part of it, you can contact the organizers through the website at beautifuldyingexpo.com is the URL. You can go there and learn a little bit about it and contact them if you're interested in being a presenter, a vendor, doing a book signing, or perhaps uh, showing a screening of a film, or or hopefully being an attendee. I'm going to be there and I'll be facilitating some of the events at the Beautiful Dying Expo, November 2nd and 3rd, 2019 in San Diego. So thank you once again for tuning in to the podcast. See you next week. And until then, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life will bring your way because it will bring you some challenges and love your life today in this moment right now. See you next week. Bye-bye.